to worship at Hilden United Church, part of the Clifton Pastoral Church for those who are joining us uh, on Monday morning when the, when the video comes out. Anyway, welcome. Uh, it's, it's good to see so many here in the middle of the summer. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, some are back uh, briefly from their uh, sojourn to the cottage and we're, we're glad you're here. So anyway. Um, announcements. Uh, I'll be here one more week with you before I go on my vacation. So next uh, Sunday is August the 1st and I'll be here and then I'm off for four Sundays. Uh, if by any chance uh, anybody needs uh, the assistance of a minister for a funeral or a pastoral emergency, if you contact Elva, she has a list of uh, folks who are on call covering for me. Uh, we have a, a group of United Church clergy in the area and we've all kind of checked out when our vacations are and when we're gonna be around and we're gonna cover for each other for the summer. Um, are there any announcements that you folks have that you wanna share with each other? Okay, how about birthdays or anniversaries or those kind of things? Diane has a birthday this week. Yes, okay. Happy birthday, Diane. All right, any others? Okay, um, so would you join me in our statement of reconciliation? Please stand as you're able and remain standing until after the call to worship. As we gather in this place, we remember with gratitude that we live and worship on lands that are, by law, the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq. May, May we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship, and friendship with its people. people. So as Arlene is lighting the two candles, our, our pride candle, our, our inclusive unity candle, and also the Christ candle. I invite you to take a moment to close your eyes and just pause to try to center yourselves a little bit in the experience of God.
We are an imperfect people, O oh God, and sometimes those imperfections distract us. Any guilt that we may have, any other things that may distract us, that we're going to do later on today. Help us to put those things aside, to really sense your presence with us here today and the word that you would have us here. And we ask this in Christ's name and for the sake of the kingdom. Amen. Amen. In the midst of the storms of life, let us gather together. We, we come, come together, together with, with each other and God, God for strength, strength and support. support. Come, let us name our fears and deal, and deal with them. Sometimes, Sometimes it feels like we're rowing, rowing against the wind, the wind and waves and making, making little headway. headway. Let us worship and give thanks to God for the one who calms the storms. So our first hymn uh, is actually a hymn that is often sung at funerals for, for uh, people in the Navy. Uh, over the years, this is one uh, that I've heard a lot at military funerals. Eternal Father, strong to save. When I first became a minister, I, uh, I came from a Baptist tradition, which really emphasizes that we're all the same, priesthood of all believers, right? And uh, no kind of hierarchy and all that. So I did not wear a clerical collar or vestments when I first started out. And uh, um, until I started realizing that there was at times and places when they might be appropriate, uh, I bought a clerical shirt for the very first time to go to court with one of my parishioners who is up on charges just to kind of show the support of God and the church with one of these members of our congregation. Uh, and I was a little bit anxious and about doing that. I mean, what if the judge hated religion, you know? <laughs> I would be in trouble. Uh, so there was always a little bit of a, of a anxiety about performing that representative function that you do 
When you wear a clerical collar, or like you, if you wear a button, or uh, a cross that's visible, or any of those kind of things, you, you are representing something. And you never can tell what kind of reaction you're going to get. I remember the first time that I wore my clerical collar to a gay pride parade back in the 1980s. I thought, what's going to happen here? And sure enough, uh, you know, recently in Halifax, uh, Trudeau was there and he and uh, his wife went by and they saw me in the clerical collar and went, you know? <laughs> but but my very, one of my very first reactions was uh, hatred and actually anger because as a representative of the church for gay people, uh, this, this collar was a symbol that not only didn't open doors, it actually shammed, slammed doors shut and made people mad and angry because of their experience, bad experience of the church and of religion and what harm it's done to them. So you're always kind of uh, wondering a little bit when you wear a symbol, whether it's a cross or a collar or a button or whatever, what, what kind of uh, message it's going to have because you're often wear these things to communicate to people that you're not used to being in touch with. People other than your friends and family. People outside of your comfort zone and zone of friendship. And I think we're called to do that, you know. We are called to take a chance to have the courage to push outside our zones of, of comfort to actually communicate the message that we are called to communicate, the love of God, the gospel, to people who are not known or familiar with us. And that's part of, the, that's a good part of the message that I want to convey in my sermon today as well. So uh, the piece of, the hymn that we're going to sing now is called God of the Bible. Or Voices 28. God of the Bible, God of the Gospel, Hope seen in Jesus, hope yet to come. You are our center, daylight or darkness, Freedom or prison, you are our home. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. God in our struggles, God in our hunger, suffering with us, taking our part. Still you empower us, mothering spirit, feeding, sustaining from your own heart. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Those without status, those who are nothing, you have made royal, gifted with rights. Chosen as partners, midwives of justice, birthing new systems, lighting new lights. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Not by your finger, not by your anger, will our world order change in a day. But by your people, fearless and faithful, small paper lanterns lighting the way. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Hope we must carry, shining and certain, through all our turmoil, terror and loss. 
bonding us gladly one to another till our world changes facing the cross. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. The scripture this morning is taken from Mark 6, verses 47 to 56. When evening came, the boat was out in the sea, and he was alone on the land. When he saw that they were straining at the oars against an adverse wind, he came towards them early in the morning, walking on the sea. He intended to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart! It is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. And through the reading of that scripture, may you hear the word of God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So I want to begin today with a question for you. Are there people or groups of people you are hesitant to engage and build relationships with? You know? I, when I was asking that question to myself, uh, a line from a song came into my mind from Brian Sergio, who's one of my favorite singers, and, and he says, If I follow Jesus, why do I have so many friends among the affluent, so few among the poor? You know, we, we tend to kind of gravitate to people who are like us. And if I look out here today, you look like a pretty homogenized group uh, in a lot of ways, you know. Uh, there are a few, if any, people of color here, and my guess is that we all would define ourselves as middle class, you know. Well, the scripture this week, I think, calls us to try to be in touch with and be in contact with and to build community with people who are different who are not always like us. And you wouldn't know it just from reading the scripture, but I'm going to tell you a bit more about why that message is that way. Because across the lake, on the other side, across the Sea of Galilee, or the Lake Gennesaret as it was called, there are people who are different. You know? The message kind of comes as a good, at a good time, right in the middle of uh, Pride Month. You know, on our pride celebrations. Uh, I, I remember we're pretty comfortable now with people of all sexual orientations. Um, least, least United Church people in mainstream uh, community are. I mean, there are still obviously folks who are uncomfortable with people who are gay and lesbian, uh, who are still a minority, uh, and, or, or we never would have had our, our flag taken down and, and that kind of thing would happen. So uh, that's one thing. We're also, uh, every, every worship service, we read a little thing about uh, the peace and friendship treaties and, uh, and, and, and giving thanks for, for meeting on land, which is Mi'kmaq. But um, I, if I didn't have indigenous folks in my own family, my, my, my grandchildren and my daughter-in-law and her family, I'm not sure how many indigenous folks I would be in contact with to have that peace and friendship with. You know, how about you folks? You know, 
Do you, do you know any folks who are indigenous and uh, are you friends with any of them? You know? Uh, you know, if you are, introduce me. I'd like to meet some folks locally. You know? Because I haven't had a lot of success in just visiting the chief or, or making emails into the band office and those kind of things. But I'm going to continue to work at that. If the church is a boat, and by the way, that's one of the symbols of the church, is the boat. Uh, one of my first pastoral charges was down in Canso. And if you look up at the ceiling uh, in, in the church in Canso, it looks like the hull of a boat, a hull of a ship, the way it's all done out, you know, uh, upside down. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of neat. And uh, the World Council of Churches, as its symbol, has a sailing ship. So for many, many years, the church was symbolized by a boat or a ship, you know. Uh, anyway, um, so this is a story about a boat and about the church, maybe. It's a story of the disciples being told by Jesus, get in the boat and go and meet me on the other side, on the other side of the lake. And they probably weren't all that happy about doing that. And yet, uh, two or three different times in the Gospel of Mark and the other Gospels, Jesus gets in the boat, and sometimes he's walking on the water, and sometimes he's at sleep, asleep in the boat, uh, but he's, he's definitely not uh, in a kind of panic the way the disciples are in almost every one of those situations, you know. Uh, so he pushes them out of their comfort zone and we're told that the wind and the waves were really pushing back against them. So no matter how hard they rode, they weren't making a lot of headway. They didn't seem to get very far, you know. And part of the reason is uh, that this may not have been just a literal story. It may have been symbolic about something that was going on, not only out here, but in here and in here with them, you know. There was a turmoil. There was wind and waves in their minds and in their hearts because what I've learned just in the last number of years is on the other side of the lake, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which was actually a lake, uh, and it kind of goes north-south uh, up in the, up around Galilee, up in that area, nor north of Jerusalem and up north. Uh, on one side of the lake was predominantly Jewish. On the other side of the lake was predominantly Gentile. And, uh, I mean, the Samaritans were there, and they weren't really Jewish. Actually, they were, they were hated by the Jews because they were sort of Jews, but not Jews. They were mixed. And, and not only mixed race, but also mixed in terms of the religion and their belief system as well, you know. Uh, somebody once told me, I think, uh, Protestants hate each other more than they hate the Roman Catholics or people of other faiths because, you know, the, 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 you know we're, we're, we're more pure than they are. And that, that's kind of sort of the feeling that a lot of uh, Jews at the time of Jesus felt about Samaritans, you know. But also, there was all these other non-Jewish people. One of the uh, strategies of Caesar and the Roman Empire was when, uh, when a soldier, if they managed to live and weren't killed in battle, if they retired, they were given a piece of land in the empire somewhere. Uh, and they were over there too, retired Roman soldiers. And so it was kind of dangerous physically to go over there. But it also was dangerous for Jews to go over there because of how they would be corrupted and become in, unclean and impure by being around non-Jews and, and people who were uh, enemies and who are Gentiles and unclean. And uh, if they didn't touch anybody over there, it might be all right, but even just the fact that they were in that area in that area of land, uh, when they came back, they would have been suspect by their friends and their neighbors. Well, you were over among those old unclean people, and uh, it really was a case of you're judged by the company you keep, right? That was part of uh, what they were about, you know. So in the Gospel of Mark, uh, 
as the story goes in the Gospel of Mark of Jesus, there is a lot of uh, mirroring that happens. Almost everything Jesus does on the Jewish side of the lake, he does on the Gentile side of the lake too. There's two sets of uh, healing stories on one side, two sets on the other. There's two sets of exorcisms on one side, there's two sets of that. There's actually two feeding of the thousands. You might not believe this, we all know about the feeding of the 5,000, which happened on the Jewish side, but there's also in the Gospel of Mark a feeding of the 4,000, which happened on the other side, over on the, on the Gentile side. So, uh, Jesus, in what he did, let alone what he said, was really trying to push his disciples out of their comfort zone, you know. Uh, they go back and forth across this lake several, several times. And yet, uh, I've said this before, but I say it again. Sometimes, uh, when we read the Gospels, we need to think of the disciples as cautionary tales. They are often, more often than not, almost, how to not be a good disciple. Because they're constantly misunderstanding, messing up, just not getting it, and even right up to the very end, they don't get it and desert and, and betray Jesus, you know. Because their idea of who Jesus was, was that he was going to be, uh, he was the Messiah, the anointed one in the line of King David, and he was going to come back and promote not only this tribal God's vision of the chosen people uh, over, and so kind of Jewish purity, Jewish homeland, Jewish state, Jewish king, all of that kind of stuff was what they were expecting of Jesus. And yet Jesus had something different in mind. And he was constantly trying to tell them that, but they didn't have the ears, or the, uh, the ears to hear or the eyes to really see it. You know? So we're told that their hearts were hardened and they didn't understand about the loaves. We're told that they were kind of like Pharaoh back in Egypt. You know? uh, they were reluctant to believe that the kingdom of God could include people that weren't like them. And you know, if you don't think the Bible is relevant to what's happening today, just look at the struggle between Israel and Palestinians, even right now. You know, one group wanting it to be just for Jews and a Jewish homeland, and another group saying, no, it's whatever. Um, one of the magazines that I get and at least browse through regularly is called Sojourners Magazine. It comes from the States. And there was an article in the last month's issue that talked about how the idea of a two-state solution in the Middle East, of Israel and Palestine, which has been promoted by the United Nations and all people that want peace over there forever and ever, just may not be viable anymore. May not be viable anymore. There are so many folks now that have been pushed off of their land and there's so many more Jewish settlers now than there were before to kind of all of a sudden rearrange the boundary lines and draw, you know, divide it would just displace so many people if it was done along racial or religious lines, you know. It's, it's a mess. It's a mess over there. But uh, the way forward may not be of separation anymore. So we'll have to, have to see. Uh, so, Uh, as I thought of this story this week, I asked myself if I've ever been re afraid or reluctant to go into an area where I knew there would be people who I might be uncomfortable with. The first group of people that came to mind was when uh, I was, had one new baby and another one on the, on the way and was... Uh, not really uh, trained to do much other than religion and I couldn't find a job and I do at that point I didn't want to be a minister uh, and so um, I took it I took a job in a prison in northern Alberta and uh, uh, as, as, a, as a prison guard a correctional officer and uh, the the um, there was over the, the number of people who came and went at the prison I was at 
was over 100% every year because there were two or three waves of recruits and some of them would go inside security in the prison, those gates would slam behind you and, and they said, no, nope, let me out, I'm out of here. <laughs> they could not handle being locked in with a group of people who were criminals. Uh, I never allowed myself to have those kind of fears, but if I thought about it long enough, I probably would have, you know. But I, began to, I realized that those people that I worked with were human beings who had screwed up, made mistakes, had problems like all the rest of us. They're human beings. And of course, prison ministry is something uh, that we're all called to. Uh, one of the people in our area here that we meet with as clergy once a month is the chaplain at the women's prison here in Truro. Uh, have, have any of you ever been there? I, I haven't. Uh, be, I think it might be interesting to kind of get to know some of those folks. Anyway, uh, that, might, that was a little bit scary. Another one was uh, World Vision took uh, Shannon and I to a, on a trip to Bolivia. Uh, Bolivia is uh, it's an interesting country. It's run by a dictator. There's lots of crime, lots of violence that's going on there. Uh, and it was kind of fearful even to venture out uh, after supper onto the, the streets of the local the city where we were in some of the times, you know. Uh, but then again, I thought, you know, you could have that kind of fear in New York, in, uh, in one of our large cities, even, in, even in, uh, in Halifax. You know, you need to be smart about where you go and what time of day you go and all those kind of things. So, well, all of us, you know, uh, uh, one of the temptations that the devil gave to Jesus uh, when he was out there in the wilderness was to throw himself off the top of the, the, the temple and get God to catch, catch him with the, you know, with the angels, catch him by, by use of angels. And uh, Jesus says, you know, don't tempt the Lord your God. Don't be stupid. And so the fear that we have sometimes is there to make us smart. But at the same time, Jesus calls us to kind of push against those fears sometimes, to be courageous, to get out of our comfort zones uh, and not let the fear of others control how we act, you know? So, who are you afraid of? Who are you afraid of to kind of be in touch with, you know? Who's on the other side of the lake? Uh, you know, uh, Jews, Jews were really kind of afraid of the water in general. They weren't seafarers or, sea, or sailors for the most part. They, they kind of were a bit afraid of the water. That's where the monster Leviathan lived underneath there, you know. And uh, so it was kind of a scary thing for them, symbolically. And symbolically, the other was scary as well, you know. Anyway. We need to ask ourselves, who are we afraid of, of being in touch with, and maybe who can we push ourselves to kind of be engaging? One of my other questions I had this week was, how did Jesus ever get to be such a courageous kind of guy? You know, uh, what made him so inclusive in terms of how he interacted with people? Because he certainly probably wasn't brought up that way. He was brought up to, within his own little village in, in uh, Nazareth, with his own little clan, all Jews. Uh, you know, what, what, what made him become such a, a boundary breaker? You know, one of the things that people describe Jesus as is a mystic. Now, mystics are not long on trying to describe their religious experiences for you, but one of the things that they have in common when they do try is this understanding of interconnectedness and oneness. And not only oneness with God, but with all of creation as an expression of the one, oneness of everything. You know, you, you know the, the joke about the, 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 the Buddhist who goes to the hot dog vendor, says, make me one with everything? Oh, anyway, just, uh, <laughs> all right, bad joke, all right. Uh, but that kind of uh, 
inclusiveness, that kind of oneness, I think, is probably where Jesus kind of got that, uh, you know, the Father and I are one, and so are all these people who my upbringing has told me I should stay away from, you know. And uh, Jesus was actually criticized for being in touch with non-Jews and, and people who are sinners. And his says, well, you know, a doctor's needed where people are, are sick, you know. Anyway, so uh, perhaps maybe this message today is about spending some time in prayer to kind of see other folks, all folks, from God's point of view. One of the things I did as I was getting ready for Canada Day was I went out and bought a flag. But it wasn't a Canadian flag. It was a flag of the globe, of the whole world. Uh, as seen from outer space. And I, I did that as a reminder to myself that uh, beyond national boundaries, beyond boundaries of race and language and religion and gender and all of these things, we are all one in terms of being loved by God and being part of the creation that's interconnected. And uh, Jesus can kind of still the storms that happen in our hearts and our souls and help us reach that other shore. Because God loves people over there. And we're called to uh, take a, a walk on that wild side of, of the lake, you know, that other shore. That is, I think, and, 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 and sometimes we have to do that quite intentionally because given our own predisposition, we probably wouldn't go there. So that, I think, is the message for today. Thanks. Amen. Jesus, Savior, pilot me Over life's tempestuous sea Unknown waves before me roll I be rock and treacherous shoal Charted compass come to thee, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. As the mother stills her child, how can hush the ocean wild? Boisterous waves obey thy will, when thy bid is then be still. Wondrous sovereign of the sea, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. When at last I hear the shore, and the fearful breakers roar, twist me and the peaceful land, still supported by thy hand, may I hear say to me, fear not, I will pilot thee. Minute for Mission today is entitled, You Were There Every Step of the Way, Jason's Story. There's a saying, you can't understand another person's experience until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Today there are 2,900 active and aspiring ministry personnel in the United Church of Canada, and you have traveled alongside them in their journey. Your gifts through mission and service support ministry students every step of the way by helping them with education costs and providing financial support. Reverend Jason Myers, a new ordinant, didn't grow up in the church. It was through a series of events that happened in my life through brokenness and suffering and having the person of Jesus influence how my life was unfolding. That ministry became an option, he explains. After his son was born, Jason couldn't ignore the call to the ministry he had felt for some time. After Isaiah was baptized, our minister asked me to write Isaiah a letter that he would read when Isaiah was confirmed as a teenager. I started to write things like, Isaiah, I want you to follow your dreams and follow what God is calling you to do in your life. Then I realized I wasn't doing that in my own life. 
That day, after writing the letter to his son, Jason walked to a theological college to learn more about ministry education. A few years later, Jason was heading off on another walk, this time to his ordination ceremony. The journey started at Emmanuel College in Toronto and ended in Barrie, Ontario, a two-week, 225-kilometer-long spiritual pilgrimage. As he walked, Jason reflected on his journey with God and prepared himself spiritually for ordination and the ministry. That was 2019. Since then, Jason, since then, what has surprised Jason most about the ministry is the expanding capacity to love. I thought that when my kids were born, that was the kind of size my heart would be, but I've come to love the church, the people, and the vocation of ministry more deeply than I ever imagined. I'm so thankful that Jesus reached into my life and invited me on this journey with him. And what would Jason say to those whose, whose generosity has supported his journey to ordination through mission and service? I'd say it's worth it. The church is alive and vibrant, and it's worth investing in. The leaders are working hard and are bringing the best of themselves into ministry, into church, and into the world. Please give a gift through mission and service. Through your gifts, you, share, you care deeply about the quality of ministry leadership. Thank you for your generosity. Love is there, training and supporting leaders every step of the way. So, the Mission and Service Funds support students going into the ministry. I just heard of one yesterday. Uh, Kevin Shannon's partner has been accepted as a student at Atlantic School of Theology, so we celebrate with him. Uh, this next step along his journey. And we thank all of you for your contributions to the Mission and Service Fund, which helps fund theological colleges and bursaries and students' education as well. Let us pray. We are very fortunate people, O oh God. You've given us so much compared to so many in the world. We ask you to help us give and be of service in return. Give of our lives, of our talents, of our time, and of our treasure. And we ask you to use all of these things for the building of your kingdom, for your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand as you're able and join me in our affirmation of faith called a new creed. We are not alone. We, we live, live in God's, God's world. world. We, we believe, believe in God, God who has created and is creating, who has come, come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Would you join me now in our prayers of the people, our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession? Let us pray. Loving Creator God, mysterious shaper of creation seen through the lens of Jesus, we come this day with many thoughts and many feelings to express to you. We feel so fortunate here in Nova Scotia to have escaped so far so many of the consequences of climate change. As we give our thanks, we can't help thinking and praying though for other folks. And we want to pray for an end to all those fires in British Columbia, those droughts in Manitoba, 
those floodings in Germany and China. We've had these things before, of course, but are we wrong to think that climate change is making them worse? Like the pandemic, it seems to know no barriers and boundaries. And so we pray for all those folks suffering in these things. We pray as well for those on the margins who are feeling the force of inflation, the rising cost of everything, along with their homelessness and hunger and poverty and unemployment. And of course, all of us are experiencing warmer temperatures these days, and who knows what that means for us. As things open up, we pray for the safety of all those who are traveling, including our athletes over at the Olympics and the other athletes from around the world. We pray especially for those in the United States who have not been vaccinated for whatever reason, and for all those affected by the rising numbers of infections there and in other countries of the world who haven't been as lucky as we are in terms of vaccines, places like India. We pray for some civility in the election that we're currently involved in and the federal one that's coming soon, we think. And we ask your spirit to help us discern how to cast our ballot. We continue to pray for Canadians as they soul search and come to new understandings of themselves and of all sorts of racism and hatred that exist here and not just in the United States and other parts of the world. Creator of all people and things, help us love not only our enemies, but those who are different from us in some way. And give us your grace to extend to others and to ourselves your love. We give thanks for camping at this time of year, whether it's our own camps or the church camps like Berwick. And we pray for all the rest and relaxation and recreation that will be happening and learning this summer. As always, God, we pray for the church, for those dealing with sickness and death and loss. Give us strength and courage and healing. Help us draw near to you as we bring our individual prayers to you now. We ask all these things now in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus, you have come to the lake shore, looking neither for worldly nor wise ones. You hardly asked me to follow humbly. Oh, Jesus, with your eyes you have searched me, and while smiling has spoken my name Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me By your side I will seek other seas You know so well my possessions My boy carries no gold you will find there my nest of labor. Oh, Jesus, with your eyes you have searched me, 
hand while smiling has spoken my name. Now my boat's left on the shore I'm behind me by your side. I will seek other seas. You leave my hands full of care through my labor And constant love that keeps on loving. Oh, Jesus, with your eyes you have searched me. And while smiling, have spoken my name. Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. By your side, I will seek other sea. fished other oceans, ever long for my souls who are waiting. My loving friend has has not to call me. Oh, Jesus, with your eyes you have searched me, and while smiling has spoken my name. I will seek other seas. As you go out today, think about where God may be calling you to go that will push you out of your comfort zone. The people who maybe aren't like you, but who need to hear the message of good news of God's love and care for them. And as you go, may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, and the Holy Spirit keep you today and always. Amen. Spirit God, be our breath, be our song, blow through the